Hi guys, George Dahl here and welcome back to my film journal. Today we're talking about a really awesome 1980s action film. The great cast, Tommy Lee Jones, Yafet Kodo, an excellent soundtrack by Tangerine Dream, who were the go-to guys for killer synth tracks in the 1980s, but a movie that unfortunately um, was sent directly to television. In Canada, where it was produced, it was shown in the theaters, but in America, it was sent straight to HBO. This is an awesome Vietnam revenge, uh, tactical excitement movie. Uh, the park is mine. His name is Mitch Garnett. I want you out of the park. What are you hassling me for? Don't treat me like I'm some kind of junkie. I'm a vet. I want you out of the park now. He's fighting back for everyone who was ever pushed too far. Well, let's not have any stupid mistakes, okay? I don't want anybody to get hurt, and nobody will get hurt if we do everything my way. He's unpredictable. We are certain that a band of well-coordinated, well-trained gorillas is responsible. Unconventional. I am the individual who controls the park. It's one guy. One guy. The Park is Mine begins with the sudden suicide of a cancer-stricken Vietnam vet who flings himself from the roof of a hospital. After attending his funeral, his friend Mitch, played by Tommy Lee Jones, is delivered a mysterious letter in which the deceased foiled plot to call attention to the plight of Vietnam veterans via taking over Central Park is outlined in detail. I had this plan to make people listen. Mitch is then spurred on by police mistreatment, a failing relationship with his estranged wife, and the love for his friend. He decides rather quickly, yet realistically, to carry out his friend's ambitious task. This all works thanks to an economical screenplay by Stephen Peters, who authored the book the film is based on. Mitch spends the next weeks preparing for his big takeover, stocking up a secret enclave in the park with weapons and explosives. He successfully mines the park in order to deter any initial police incursion. City Hall, Officer Balkan. I want you to listen hard. I have a message for New York City. As of right now, Central Park is mine. As Mitch becomes more mired in his predicament, the walls begin to close in. Yafet Kodo, the even-keeled officer in charge of the siege, advocates for a less aggressive strategy, while the mayor's office increasingly becomes more and more embarrassed and more desperate to rid the city of these shenanigans. Mitch demands that he remain in the park for purposes of symbolism. And as his relationship with Helen Shaver's news reporter Valerie grows, he begins to sermonize on the state of the modern world, the displaced feeling that many have living in an autonomous, bustling city, and his advocacy for veterans begins to grow him a following. As Mitch's three-day siege continues, he becomes increasingly desperate and the cracks in his aggressive facade begin to fade, revealing a frustrated man whose failures in professional and married life have left him with a feeling that he doesn't matter and can't affect positive change in his own life. I'm getting sick and tired of hearing what a loser I am. Especially from you. Well, then why in God's name don't you just do something about it? Tommy Lee Jones is, is excellent in the movie. He's got a lot of, like, giddy energy. No big thing at all. <laughs> You've only uh, taken over Central fucking Park! You hear that, Rachel? <laughs> I finally did something! And I think the costuming in the movie is, like, really spectacular. There are a lot of, like, subtle touches. I like when Tommy Lee Jones is walking around surveying the park at the beginning of the movie. And something that struck me is that he has one leg of his jean folded up and the other not, which sort of shows where his headspace is. He's not exactly in equilibrium. He's messy. He's got things out of order. And he's not thinking about how people perceive him from day to day. He's just sort of shuffling through life. His costume when he decides to take over the park, I, I mean, it's iconic. I think that I'm surprised that more people don't dress up like this for Halloween. <laughs> the awesome Top Gun uh, aviators, the uh, New York Yankees hat, which it does a lot to distinguish him from just like a regular military guy in his fatigues because it separates him from being like a radical activist. I mean, maybe a costume designer or a writer who had less, um, 
less creativity, maybe would have just put him in like a military beret or something, or uh, painted his face with camo. But the fact that he's wearing a New York Yankees hat goes a long way to show that he is just an average regular guy. He's a New Yorker just like everybody else. He's not a hateful terrorist. He is a patriot. And what he's doing, he's trying to call attention to a specific cause. My name is not important. I'm just a guy. Nobody pays much attention to guys like me. I don't mean just because I'm a vet. I mean because my whole life has been directed by other people. I guess I let him. There's a lot of people like me in this city. They don't feel any control over their lives. And I think that it garners a lot of sympathy from us, the audience, and you can see that in the crowd. I mean, obviously, why wouldn't people love this guy? He's a very Howard Beale style character, like from Network. He's mad as hell. He's not going to take it anymore. And I think intrinsically, Americans are just radical and rebellious enough to appreciate when someone goes out on a limb and does something crazy. What this guy is doing, you see, he's sort of speaking out for all of us, right? Right? Yeah. Only in America, right? Yo. So the movie's a lot different from the book. It's very difficult to get a hold of the book. Um, I've not read it, but from what I've heard, it differs very radically from the movie. In the movie, Tommy Lee Jones is made into a more sympathetic character. He doesn't formulate the idea to take over the park. It just kind of falls in his lap. Whereas in the book, the character is much more unstable and insane. He plans to take over the park, not to draw attention to a good cause, not to make a stand for the little guy, but to relive his Vietnam experience. And from what I've heard on uh, Grady Hendrix's blog, guy who wrote a really great book, a, a sort of gallery coffee table book about uh, 1980s and 70s horror books that I would highly recommend you check out. But on his blog, he talks about in the book, um, he kills almost 100 police officers just kind of for sport. In the movie, obviously, it's toned down much more. Tommy Lee Jones is much more th sympathetic. The movie goes out of its way, sometimes awkwardly, to show that he is doing everything he can to not hurt police officers, not cause any death or mayhem. The grenade launchers lie, boys. Now backtrack 72nd Street and head out to 5th Avenue right now. And for the most part, it's, it's fairly realistic when you're watching it. You buy that potentially maybe something like this could happen because Tommy Lee Jones is able to get the press involved and take the reins away from the city by garnering the appreciation of the public. So therefore, uh, just killing him and dispatching him would be, you know, politically uncool, perhaps. However, the movie knows that it's got to have, because it, it, it stalls there. It's like, okay, well, if Tommy Lee Jones can't really have it out with these guys, like in the competitor film, you know, Rambo, where he's just shooting everybody, it's a smorgasbord of death or commando. Uh, what are we going to do? Well, the movie introduces an element where the assistant deputy mayor goes, you know what we're going to do? We're going to bring in a, a, some hired elite killers to take him down. The other man is Tran Chan Din. He hooked up with Verdenkin in Vietnam. He's a master of guerrilla warfare. They come highly recommended. Commission, what you're telling me is that these we, we have two hired killers? One of them a fucking Viet Cong to go in and get this man? So therefore, the audience has permission to appreciate when Tommy Lee Jones kills people and we get some nice, you know, exploding blood packs and shootouts. Um, it's sort of a cheat. And to be honest, the movie seemed like it had a little bit more class than that. I mean, if you're going to do this, if you're going to say, hey, our, our end uh, climax has got to be explosive, then go all Rambo. Bring in 15 guys. Have Tommy Lee Jones go out in a blaze of glory or something. I mean, really, really, let's, let's have an explosive fight. I don't know if they had enough budget for that. But um, if you were going to do that thematically, if you're going to take that right turn and go, you're going to veer off like that, you might as well, you know, go all out and have a big shootout. But that's not exactly what they did. And therefore, it sort of poisons a little bit of the goodwill the movie had before. Um, as a socially conscious picture, it sort of cheapens what came before it a little bit. So, like a lot of other movies that we talk about on this channel, this film was little seen, underappreciated, a bit of a hidden gem. And I think there are two big reasons for that. Number one being that it wasn't a theatrical release. It was purchased by HBO from a Canadian production company, where in Canada it was in the theaters. Um, back in the 1980s, it was difficult with the transition to multiplex cinemas to 
have these big chains sign on to buy an independent film. They were much more comfortable with buying package deals from big studios and getting everything for a day and date release. Those, those, like today, those screens were booked up with big blockbusters from American studios. Therefore, The Park is Mine was purchased by the then up and coming pay movie channel, HBO. And if this wasn't the first HBO made for TV film, it was definitely the best, most high profile, expensive one. And I think that an average viewer of HBO would have been surprised at the quality of this made-for-television film. Plus, you've got a really big star, Tommy Lee Jones, who was really on the rise in his career, having starred in Coal Miner's Daughter, which was a big hit and nominated for a lot of Academy Awards. I think another reason why this movie gets lost in the shuffle is because there were a lot of films like this being released at the time. The story of the jaded, jilted uh, Vietnam veteran character who'd come home from war only to find society having moved on without him. Oftentimes these characters became violent, they had some kind of psychosis, which was a common perception of Vietnam vets at the time. After all, significantly less men from America served in Vietnam than had in, say, the Korean War or World War II. So it was a little aspect of the population that a lot of people couldn't really wrap their heads around. They didn't know very many Vietnam vets, and therefore they all sort of were marginalized, which also led to the Vietnam Veterans of America Association being formed in 1979 to help fight against these harmful stereotypes and fight for equity for veterans who had come home to not a lot of aplomb. There were lots of movies like this at the time being made. You had uh, Rolling Thunder, written by Paul Schrader, which would actually make a terrific double feature with this movie. The movie also features a very intensely grim performance from a young Tommy Lee Jones. And most famously, you have Rambo. And though Rambo was an action picture, it did have a lot more focus on like the troubles that a veteran would have with post-traumatic stress disorder and feelings of alienation. It's all in the past now. For you! For me, civilian life is nothing! In the field, we had a code of honor. You watch my back, I watch yours. Back here, there's nothing. You're the last of an elite group. Don't end it like this. Back there, I can fly a gunship. I can drive a tank. I was in charge of million dollar equipment. Back here, I can't even hold the job. Fucking guys! Ah! Which are dealt with a lot in this movie, as well as in Rolling Thunder. <laughs> I can't sleep. Those pills you gave me don't work anymore. Those movies were all like deep meditations on what it means to come back to civilian life after war and how that can really change a person for the worse. But by the time 1985 rolled around, we'd already moved on as a country and the wound had healed a little bit. With Rambo 2, for instance, which eschews a lot of you know social commentary and goes straight in for action. You know, it was the Reagan years, and right after that we had the Rambo rip-off Missing in Action with Chuck Norris, which is all about how Vietnam veterans went back for revenge and kicked everybody's ass. And by the mid-80s, I think the perception of the Vietnam veteran as someone who was unstable or had mental issues maybe started to shift into a person with a very unique experience who, because of what they went through in the war, they might live down the street from you, but they have amazing tactical and military knowledge and capabilities. Somebody's in here trying to sabotage my program, Valerie. Holy shit, that mine is real. Real? Yeah. Claymore. What's a Claymore? It's an anti-personnel device, Valerie. There was a whole rash of characters that came about at this time, or gained more popularity. Like, think about it in comic books. The Punisher, Frank Castle. What's the explanation for why he's so good at killing people? He's not a regular guy. He's a Vietnam vet. The A-Team on television. Why are these guys such impressive badasses? Well, they were all in Vietnam together. And as you know, if you went to Vietnam, you know some shit, you saw some shit, and you could really tear stuff up. And I think it as we got into the more patriotic Reagan years, this was a more palatable idea of the Vietnam veteran. As someone who was like a suburban commando, someone who reasonably could pull off a mission like Tommy Lee Jones does in The Park Is Mine. What are you doing in here? We were just going through to the west side. There are thugs and muggers and priests in this park at night. You don't bring a lady in this park at night. Where are you from? Overall, though, I really enjoyed this movie, guys. I hope you check it out. I hope you check out uh, Rolling Thunder as well. I might do a retrospective looking back at Vietnam films of the era and how they transitioned. How do we get from Apocalypse Now to Rambo to The Enforcers to Rolling Thunder and then to Platoon and Full Metal Jacket? 
Um, I'd love to talk about that. But in the meantime, thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe if you're feeling charitable. This channel is growing all the time, guys. I've got a good feeling about it. So thanks for watching again. And here's another video that you might enjoy.